Radio Mela Saubo Naita. Thank you, Church. My name is Lesejo, I'm one of the elders here at Fellowship City. And this morning I have the privilege of opening the Word of God with you uh, to look at what heritage is and what heritage uh, stands for as we look at it through the book of Colossians. Over the last few weeks, we've been in a series titled Real Talk. Uh, Real talk, according to the Urban Dictionary, is a philosophy of talking candidly, openly, and honestly without fear of what others might think. Real talk is also used to let someone know of something that may be hard to speak about or something hard that is coming. As a church, sometimes we need some real talk uh, to ask the hard questions and to resolve finding practical biblical solutions that bring about real lasting change. As a church, we long to see transformation in the lives of our people. We long to see people grappling with life and people flourishing. This morning, we look at heritage. Heritage as described by South African History Online is a simple idea that is made up of practices and traditions that are passed on from parents to children. The practices and traditions also have to do with what has been passed on from the family, from the community, and place where people are raised. This definition means that our upbringing, our family, and community creates spaces in which tradition and practices bring about a heritage that we live from. Cultural heritage can also be described as music, as art, as dance, as clothing, as language. Examples of dance include the Zulu in Glamour, which is a well-known Zulu dance which tends to bring about a lot of dust, uh, or Espantola, Uh, the dance, not the person. Um, Examples of food include the cook sister, which is a fried pastry with syrup, or poikikos, which is a long-cooked stew that is not stirred, but placed over wood in a cast iron pot, or mopani worms, a semi-dried worm-like delicacy. I almost said chicken feet as well, but I'm not sure which culture would claim that. So examples of dress include the blanket worn by the Sotho by Sotho people, the khaki brook worn by farmers, or the kavela, which is a shoe that is worn by Dai Bra and Dai Man from Pretoria, <laughs> or the Skotani, uh, who have their own heritage, which includes drinking and spilling ultramarine custard while wearing expensive clothes, or the Tsonga Shibelani dress, which are colourful and worn sometimes while performing a dance. I will not be trying that. But that Chibelani dress apparently is not to be touched by men. For men, I hope this does not make you want to touch it even more. So examples of traditional functions or ceremonies like Umembe, so which is a pre-wedding celebration in Zulu, sometimes with an ending where money, stacks of money, is put before or on the bride's head. Sometimes heritage speaks into identity as well. Um, Some prominent ideas being that Africans have either Jesus Christ or ancestors to call on. We will come back to this idea. Another idea is that the gospel is only a Western concept. So Christianity is only for my vanilla brothers and sisters. Another one, other ideas we'll come back to. But this morning we have four people who are eager to share their heritage, their stories with us. I will ask them a couple of questions, then I'll ask them to to go back down once we've done that, to take a seat, and I'll come back up to speak through Colossians 2, verses 6 to 10, and to see what it has to say about heritage. Then we'll have a and a right at the end if you do want to ask any questions. So before the panel discussion starts, let me pray for us, and then I'll call them up. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that this morning we can gather as your people to speak about heritage and to understand what the gospel has to say about heritage. I pray that as we have different people, different voices up on stage that would be eager to listen, eager to hear and learn from one another the stories that have made us who we are, but also eager to hear how we can continue to love one another, support one another, and do life together as we embrace the different cultures and heritage that exist, as we reflect on this, as we embrace it, as we enjoy it, 
and only then by the power of the gospel transcend it. We pray that by your Holy Spirit that you be here this morning, that you guide our conversation, guide our hearts. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'd like to call on uh, Bethany, Kuliso, Kune, and Reino to come forward. It is hot here, church. Uh, this is how we dress in a summer as well. Um, in winter, the blanket is all around me. Uh, but for, for this morning, it's just on my shoulder. And that's how, that's how we roll. Um, I'm going to ask the first question, which is uh, asking you guys to tell us a little bit about yourselves, your heritage, where you come from, how you came to understand your heritage. And I'll ask all of them to share um, and whoever wants to go first can do so. I'll go. Uh, morning, church. My name is Kuliso. Um, I don't pronounce it right. Uh, there's a proper vendor way of pronouncing it. but um, So I'm vendor by heritage. My father's vendor, my mom's Tswana. Um, I grew up in Gauteng, which is quite a mixed area. So I think growing up, I didn't get to know too much of my heritage because I didn't live in a place where heritage is expressed um, in everyday life. Um, also, I went to school far away from home. Um, so I went to high school in Pretoria. I went to varsity very far away. Um, so heritage for me, or the experience of it, has always been at significant moments in life. So if someone's getting married, or if there's a funeral, um, or any other cultural thing that I suppose we'll get into. That's kind of how I learned. This is how Vendor people do this. This is how it's different to Tswana people. This is what Zulus do, and all the drama that comes in between. Thank you, Kuliso. I'll go next. Hi, everyone. I'm Kwane, a fellow Vendor uh, to Kuliso. Um, so I was introduced to, so firstly, I'm from a village in Vendor called Romondo Chifranani Pasihabad. Um, so Pasihabad, that's the only part I can translate, means under the road, yeah. Um, and we are on, under a chieftaincy, which is the Neromondo chieftaincy. Um, I didn't grow up there, I grew up in Binoni, funny enough, so I was only introduced to my heritage and culture uh, probably around the age of 12, 13, when I actually moved back home to live in Venda. Um, and I was introduced to it um, through things such as language, because that's when I started speaking the Venda language. So prior to that, I only spoke English and Zulu, because I'd grown up in Joburg, Binoni. Uh, so when I moved back home, my mom's like, English is not going to fly. We live in a village. You need to learn how to speak a uh, vendor. So I can only speak it. I can't read or write it. Um, I was also introduced uh, to my heritage uh, through things such as food, because then we'd have to eat more traditional food, such as mupani worms. Um, there's something, guys, called thongolipa. <laughs> thongolipa looks like a roach and smells like a roach. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's when I was introduced to, to my culture through clothes and um, being amongst the people, yeah. I was born in Derbs, 1985, but grew up in Pretoria. I uh, have two parents, mom and dad, both still alive, both still together. They've been married for 42 years. One of uh, three brothers, brother two years older than me, and then a brother seven years younger than me, still all really, really tight. We all attended the same schools and the same university. Large school, Monument Park, Weir School, Waterkloof, and then the University of Pretoria. I studied two degrees, both undergraduate and masters, all in Afrikaans. So if you ask me, how did I become aware of my heritage? <laughs> Until the age of 26, I was 100% fully immersed in it. Wow. So since I could remember. Uh, I married Marie, who's also white and Afrikaans, so our family didn't diversify through our marriage. We have two kids, Ava and Katie. Afrikaans is our home language. So um, I have known how to be an Afrikaans person 
since my first memory. Okay. Uh, I often say to people, I am as Pretoria as they come. <laughs> Even though I studied in Pretoria, we got married in Pretoria, we've lived in four houses in Pretoria, and I've only ever worked in Pretoria. <laughs> So I can call you uh, Diamond and Diabra as well. <laughs> absolutely, okay. absolutely. Thank you, mate. Um, so I'm Bethany, married to Koliso. So I would be very English, I think. Not I think, I know. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I grew up in Midrand. Well, yeah, my family's from, also from KZN, quite a big farming, English farming family in KZN. And then um, we, my parents moved to Joburg. My dad was a pastor, so his... Um, ministry brought him here and then my sort of formative years were in Midrand which is, was a very transcultural kind of community at that time so I went to a very transcultural school um, so as much as I was English it was kind of a joke because I had a Portuguese one of my best friends was Portuguese and she's like are you English people you don't even have a culture like you don't know who you are <laughs> so <laughs> that was kind of the running joke and I think yeah it was there was that to a certain extent um, I think we were very we we're a very Christian family, so I think a lot of the influence and things was more churched, sort of English family. Um, but it's cool that we did have a very like um, open approach. Well, we were just exposed to a lot of different cultures and different people. So getting married to Kuliso wasn't like that much of a shock to like my system or my parents' system. Like we were quite exposed to that, so that was quite cool. Thank you, thank you, Bethany. What you will uh, note is that uh, we've got a lot of diversity here, diversity of backgrounds. Uh, we'll hear a little bit more about their heritage now. So the next question I'll ask um, is, what are some things in your heritage that you appreciate, and what are some things that you believe should be challenged in light of the gospel? Oh, I'm first, okay. Um, so what I appreciate, um, I really appreciate, um, so there's something in Venda when you're growing up, we call it Urosha, and my prop isn't here, Neo was my prop actually, she was supposed to come demonstrate for us. <laughs> but Urosha is a way when you're growing up, um, you greet, um, and also um, at weddings and things like that, you do that. So the women lie down on the side and then they'll put their hands to the side. Uh, but if you're just in the home, it's just on your knees, and then the guys usually take one knee. Um, that's how you greet. So when visitors would come over growing up, we would do that. They'd call you to come greet the visitors, and you don't do it standing up. So it's just a sign of respect, and that's something that, you know, I don't do it with other people, but just the respect that has been instilled um, in me from that I've carried through, and, you know, you see it throughout. Uh, I remember my parents were here this weekend, so yesterday my dad... Uh, comes up and he's giving me money and then he also gives uh, my three nieces money and then my one niece takes um, the money with one hand and you can't do that when an older person you have to clap your hands and it's a sign of respect so things like that I really appreciate uh, you know it teaches you to respect other people as well um, I appreciate our attire uh, yesterday my M and I were at the stores and I was wearing these bangles um, because it helps us identify each other and the lady at the other till, she works at the store as we're walking past, because she only had three, she's like, yo. And then she speaks to me in our language, and she's like, if only I could have a few from your wrist, and automatically. And there was a security guard as well um, at this other store. Um, he heard us speaking uh, in our language between myself, my sister, and my mom, and he approached us and spoke to us and assisted us, you know. So uh, it's, I like it because it helps us identify each other, so things like, attire, accessories, you know, those little mannerisms teach respect and you carry that throughout your, your life. Must I also answer the things that I don't? I mean, if you do have one that you want to share with us, yes. So what, one of the things that you don't, that you would want to see. So I think some of the things are quite oppressive. I wouldn't say abusive, but quite oppressive um, to women. Um, you know, growing up, you see your moms, your aunts serving the men a lot. Um, and that's carried through. And then I'm just, I always wonder, I'm like, when do the men get to serve us? You know, you'll see your mom cooking, cleaning, doing that. Then she still has to go after cooking, serve your dad and whatnot. And then after, she still has to come get the, the plates and then wash them again. And this person is just sitting. Um, and I'm just like, you know, they look like they're happy to do it, but I just, I don't understand it. And, you know, as I was discussing it as well with my mom, she's like, yeah, things like that, you know, can be quite oppressive. You know, um, in terms of serving, it's not quite equal. 
you don't see the, the men serving um, the women as much. So yeah, that's something that I, I don't really like. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Kune, for sharing. You know. um, do you want to go next, mate? Uh, yeah, sure. What I appreciate about the Afrikaans folk, uh, we have two sayings. The one is, a boer maak a plan. <laughs> that means not a farmer makes a plan, an Afrikaans person makes a plan. And then the other one is a combined word, it's fastbite. Fastbite means biting on your teeth and gritting it through. So I appreciate that. That speaks of our resilience as a people group. Um, it speaks of our grit, right? our fastbite. It speaks of our innovation, because you just never give up. Never. You make a plan, and you keep going. And I appreciate that of our culture. It served me well, uh, I mean, in the 38 years that I've lived, uh, in terms of pushing through when times are hard, um, looking for creative solutions to get something done, and just never, ever, ever giving up. So I would say if I have to choose one thing, it'll be uh, that of our folk. One thing that I think should be challenged in light of the gospel is um, history has taught us, our Afrikaner history has taught us that when we uh, have fundamental differences, we often divide and we go our own way. And I don't think that served us well through our history, and I also don't think that serves us well at the moment. Because Afrikaans folk, if they go their way, they'll innovate and do something new, and establish something new, but it's always on their own. Until there's conflict, and then they split again, and then they just do their own thing again. So that's something that's ingrained in our culture, is you and I are not going to get along, you go your own way, and I'll go my own way. And I don't think that divisive spirit will serve us well, and I think the gospel speaks into that, specifically in the context of church. Because even though we are very different from one another, we are going to have to find a way to stay together. <laughs> because going your own way, and me going my own way, just won't work in the body of Christ. It's definitely not going to work in Fellowship City as well. So, I mean, there's a lot to double-click there. But as I reflected on Afrikaans culture, I think that would be the one thing I feel that should be challenged. Okay. So, if anyone wants to know why a boor marks a plan does not mean a farmer, feel free to meet Reino outside by the, by the braai there and challenge where the farmer and, uh, comes into the picture there. Um, Bethany? Um, so... I think growing up in quite an Eng uh, from coming from quite an English background, I'd say that what I appreciate is maybe the first thing, opposite of what Courtney said, kind of the lack of roles in our homes. So um, there's not like men do this and women do this and children do this. It's kind of very fluid, and it's very much like what season you're in, you kind of adapt as a family. So like men will cook if like if your wife is working full time, like you'll cook, you'll clean, like. It's very much a partnership rather than this is the way it's done. And I, I, do, I really appreciated that growing up, like seeing my dad so involved and so willing to help. And just that was kind of normalized across like our friendship groups and everything. It wasn't just for our own family. And then secondly, I think like English people are very relational. And I, I don't, I think that's also um, not saying that other cultures aren't at all, but I think it would be like with parents and children, we very much, um, are relational with our children and I think that's like we have this almost like natural organic relationship that forms with our parents I think then on the flip side of that is that there is a lack of respect and boundaries and structure so I think like also chatting to Afrikaans colleagues they'll say like they used to laugh as kids because you would be you would be playing against an English school and they'd just be like no culture, no structure, no respect, kind of that kind of thing. So it does have a flip side to it, but I can just see the relationship that we all have with our parents. It's very dynamic, very so like everyone is on the same um, wavelength kind of. And then obviously the other thing that's not always great about the English culture is that we are a very privileged and entitled culture, unfortunately, because of our history. And I think that comes with a whole bunch of nuances and complications. But the one thing I would say is just the intolerance sometimes to engage with difference. And it's like we, we're quite individualistic and quite selfish because we're used to getting what we want and because we're used to having so much. It's like, well, why must I engage with poverty? Why must I engage with race? Why must I engage with these issues? Um, 
And then I think going into Kuliso's family as well, which is a vendor family, and obviously has these structures of respect. It was tough because I didn't come from a background where like respect is so indoctrinated. So then it was also like trying not to rebel against that naturally is hard. So it's a continuous push and pull of like trying to understand it rather than just rebel against it kind of thing. So yeah. Uh, yeah, we so need, we need to learn the name because you, you did mention the pronunciation. And hey. we, we need to get to that pronunciation. <laughs> but could you so, yeah. In university, they called me KJ because I was like, I'm not going to even. <laughs> um, so I learned, like I said, I learned my culture through time. Um, so I think a lot of things I got to appreciate with time as I learned. I think from vendor people or from the vendor nation, like Bethany says, I think respect. So there's a lot of hierarchy. Um, I think some of the things Gwene says resonate and questions I asked growing up, you know, my sisters, we all relate to the same, we all wash dishes, we all swept the house, but as soon as we had an event, my sisters are lying on the floor and then like I'm with the boys and um, yeah, I mean, even now as I've been married, so in vendor culture, when you show respect to someone, you add V-H-O before their name, pronounced Bo. So I'm referred to as Boramashia, as like in my ripe young age where you know my sisters may not be the same thing so because i'm married and i'm male and stuff like that so i think the respect element i think is something i've come to appreciate um then i think work ethic as well i think it's I've, there's this thing amongst vendor people that you you work hard you study you know you push uh, all the vendor people are nodding um so i think i've come to respect that and i think growing up in the reef and meeting vendor people who had come from vendor and seeing that, um, yeah, that was encouraging for me to learn. Um, from Tswana people, I think it's style, hey? Like, um, that's, just, that's just the thing, so um, something I've learned to appreciate from them. Um, in terms of challenges, I think, so heritage and culture, it's, it's kind of a function of where we come from, then it informs our practices, and there's an element of identity there, which I think on the one hand is great, but I think the flip side of it is that it becomes exclusive. So if I'm vendor, I'm with vendor people. If I'm Tswana, I'm with Tswanas. Um, and I think like what Bethany was saying with English people, I think even in African cultures, there becomes um, sort of a, a gap um, of exclusivity. And I think in modern times now, as we're wrestling with a lot of issues, you know, the influence of the West, um, conversations in African spaces about religion, that it came on a boat, um, and that kind of thing, I think the, the marriage or the, the conceptual marriage to culture kind of creates um, distance between us and it sometimes precludes helpful conversations. So to have gospel conversations amongst people who look like me um, sometimes becomes tough because it's like, well, you've sold out and married a Caucasian woman. Um, what do you have to say about culture type of thing? Um, in fact, we should be telling you about culture and how we do things. And then you ask yourself, what is the main thing? You know, is it our eternity or is it how we relate on earth type of thing? Yeah. Yo, thank you, Voramashia. Um, so I'm going to ask another question. That th this is for, for one or two people to answer. If you feel uh, led to answer, feel free to answer. If no one answers, I'm going to pick someone, right? Um, so we speak about being a transcultural church. What does that mean for you? Oh, cool. <laughs> okay, so I thought about this one. Um, so I think I said for me, um, the biggest thing is the reason why I think it's important um, is for me not to see people and you guys as just demographics, um, but to have a heart for God's people and to increase my sensitivity um, towards God's people uh, because I think then that clearly uh, reflects uh, it will more clearly reflect God's image mm. and how he created us uniquely. So for me, that's the biggest thing. So just not to see people, yeah. but uh, yeah, to see God's people, you know, people who, like myself, are in need of salvation mm. um, and grace, yeah. Thank you for that. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so maybe to speak from my children's perspective, which is a bit of an emotional one, but let me just try explain. So my children are obviously mixed race, and then they're Christian children. So they are going to go into a world where they are not accepted by anybody because they come from parents who are from different cultures and different races, and then they're going to be preaching the gospel in a world that is becoming more and more hostile to that. So to come to a church every Sunday and be part of a family that represents 
all races and all people is a it's a deal breaker for us because that is that's what we know our children are going to need and that's what they're going to fall back on because in a world where they are not going to be accepted and where they're going to be rejected this is going to be their safe place and because of that this is going to be our safe place and i think for us that's a huge a huge yeah. thing so yeah. yeah thank you for sharing that um just for, the, for those that didn't answer now you, you get an opportunity right uh, what makes it hard for people within your heritage to accept christ as Lord and Savior. So what makes it hard for people within your heritage to accept Christ? Yeah, so I think I'll elaborate on what I was saying earlier. I think, so like I say, for me, heritage is a function of where you come from and this kind of space that you're in at a given time. Um, it could be cultural, truly, like a, a set culture of Afrikaans or something like that, or a function of the space that you're in. So for me, young black males who or in a working space, you know. Um, so I think around, so I'll refer to that as my current heritage. I think around that space, there's a lot of like cerebralism, as in like, let's figure things out. Um, and I think that introduces that conversation. So people talk about Christianity coming from the West. Um, there's a big move to reclaim being African. And that comes with a whole host of things. I know a lot of guys that I grew up with who are now going back to trying to understand ancestral worship and, um, and that kind of thing. So I think in a, in a country where our parents have been so broken by our country's history and we've inherited a lot of those stories and a lot of that pain, I think accepting the gospel, one, to accept a God that loves all of us, even despite what's happened in the world and in our country, um, and two, um, a non-Western God. I think that within the spaces I find myself in, I think that's what makes the gospel conversation difficult. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Brother. Loving this conversation, by the way. Uh, I think for us as Afrikaans folk, probably the biggest stumbling block, one of the biggest stumbling blocks is submitting to the Lordship of Christ. That makes it difficult for Afrikaans folk, I believe, to become Christians and to be transformed by the Spirit and to really grow into what God wants for them. Because growing up in a system and in a culture that is very churched, Christianity was often presented to Afrikaans folk as a list of things that you have to do. And if you do this list of things, you're good. So I grew up remembering full well that I can't understand how the same oaks around the braai on a Saturday sit in the deacon pews on a Sunday because what they said and did last night and what they say and do this morning just doesn't make sense at all. So I grew up with that cognitive dissonance of going, it seems like something that you have to do. So if I attend church and I give my tithe and I say the right things in the right places, I'm all good. And that's not what Christianity is about. So then to make that massive mind and soul shift to say, if I really want to follow Jesus, it means he calls the shots, I do it on his terms, and I submit under his authority fully. That's a, that's a tough one. I don't think our tribe does well with submitting under authority. And I mean, that links back to what Bethany said. That comes from our privileged past mm -hmm. or whatever we deem to believe we fought for. Mm -hmm. Just a side note, I remember during the COVID-19 pandemic how different the conversations were between the white folk about all the lockdown regulations and then our church folk <laughs> about all the lockdown regulations. And among the white folk, it started with, there's no way I'm going to do it. They're not going to tell me what to do. Like, <laughs> let's start there. Hardcore. I am generalizing. Okay, some people might have been obedient. But I remember having those conversations over there. And that just speaks of, I will not submit to anyone. Yeah. And I don't think that works well in your relationship with Jesus. Like, you're really going to struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Just while you're holding the mic there, as an Afrikaans white male, why would you go and plant a transcultural church? Why not just continue the heritage? Yeah, sure. So before I'm white and before I'm Afrikaans, I am a child of God. And that's important to me. So I was saved by him. I was redeemed by him. I'm in the process of being restored by him. And then I was called by him to do his work. And when I accepted the call into ministry, even though it was into a white Afrikaans church, my only discipleship mantra was obey right away. So when I started ministry up until now, it's been 16 years, I have done what God has asked of me. Mm -hmm. 
And he gave us the vision to plant a transcultural church. If I say us, it was Marie and I first, really discerning that this is what God wants for us to do. And I simply said, yes. And from 2018, my whole ministry life has changed to where we are today. I think, uh, so, so that qualifies me much more than anything else could disqualify me. But let me at least say this. I know this city really well. And I know this area really well. And I know the dynamics of people and church and education and communities in this city really well. And that's why when we took on this challenge or when we said yes, I thought to myself, well, at least I know the space. <laughs> so I'll be able to know where and how we should do this and through God's grace and through discernment build something that he wants us to build. So that's why, mate, because God called me to do this and I said yes. Okay. Thank you, mate. So for, for anyone who wants to answer this one, so how can we be a community that continues to reflect, embrace, and enjoy the diversity of our context and then by the power of the gospel transcend it? So how can we be this community? What are some of the practical things that can enable us to be this kind of community? Can I throw in a one-liner while I have the yeah, mic? Yeah. Check this. Desire to move from proximity, mm -hmm. closeness, to affection. Yeah. This is where you want to be. Yeah. And if you desire that, because proximity isn't something that's new in South Africa. Everyone is in proximity to people other than them every single day. But it's about turning towards mm. and facing and really getting to know one another yeah. and growing in your affection for one another. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Connie, do you want to, do you want to say something? Okay, cool. <laughs> I think also not being afraid to look silly. So going into spaces where you don't belong, you may not have the vocab or you say the right thing, you know, um, but not being afraid of that, yeah. putting the pride aside and saying, like with children, children don't care. Mm -hmm. Go and say whatever to anyone and that's how they build, like Reno says, the affection. So I think, yeah, just being um, vulnerable. Yeah. So thank you to our panel. They will be back here for Q&A towards the end. I'm gonna ask them now if they could step down uh, take a seat. I'm going to look at Colossians and see what the, the Bible has to say about heritage. So the book of Colossians is a, ve is, a, is a very relevant book in our day and not only for the Colossians who Paul wrote to. We live in a time where we are confronted by human culture or philosophy in this technologically aware time. We did hear Bethany speak a little bit about the confrontation of culture earlier on. Society continues to believe in itself, to live without God, in the actions of self-preservation, secular humanism, meaning and non-religious worldview rooted in science and humanistic ethics, or religious syncretism, meaning the merging of two religions or belief systems to suit oneself. Colossae was a more predominantly Gentile city, but there were a lot of Jews. Um, Paul writes this letter to people he doesn't know but has heard about. He writes to address false teaching. The way he writes, it's clear that the false teaching was undermining the sufficiency, supremacy, and nature of Christ as God and man, nature of Christ as Savior and Creator of the world. And we see this in Colossians 2 verses 15 to 20, a dialogue piece or poem-like piece that Paul mentions about the supremacy of Christ. So the false teaching was minimizing Christ being enough, was making Christ not far above all authority and power. But Paul says no. Paul says Christ is enough, making Christ not, Christ is enough, Christ is supreme and far above all rulers and authority. Three points this morning, Paul's instruction, Paul's warning, and some wisdom. Let's look at the first one, Colossians 2, verse, um, Colossians 2, verse 6. Let me read the passage for us as we get into God's Word. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in Him, being rooted and built up in Him and established in the faith, just as you were taught and overflowing with gratitude. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. 
For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. So we see that in Colossians 2 verse 6, Paul gives instructions to the Colossians to be rooted, to be built up and established in the faith. Why? Because they were taught this, and they also received Christ. The word received is an interesting word. The same word is used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 23, the first part of it, which says, For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. So Paul is saying he received from the Lord and passed on to them. What is it that is received? Or what is it that he received? That's a great question. He received tradition, oral tradition, and teaching that he must pass down from generation to generation. This teaching or this doctrine is about Jesus. It's about his death, his resurrection, ascension, and ultimate return. This teaching is about a tradition of walking in Jesus because of his supremacy, because of his sufficiency, and, the nat- and his nature as God and man, his nature as Savior and Creator. So Paul calls us to walk in him. In him, I believe, refers to what Paul has already shared about him, the centrality and the supremacy of Christ. So you've received this teaching and this tradition about Christ who is Lord. You were taught this, then walk in him. That is what Paul is saying. In accordance to what you know about him, and also walk in him through faith. Look at the word gymnastics that Paul is using here. There's two images that enable this walking in him and this faith. The first image is rooted, which is imagery of a tree with deep roots. This tree will be hard to waver or move, and this tree is built up. And, and, and the built up is a second imagery, sorry. Built up, which is the imagery of a structure that is well built, contains a foundation, and will be easily established. It's important imagery because there is opposition of fine-sounding arguments that are coming, which try to pervert or change the tradition or use first birth tradition to oppose the faith. So first birth tradition would be tradition that you received before Christ and accepting Christ as Lord. So using that first birth tradition to oppose the second birth tradition through faith. So just a quick side road. By the use of tradition here and the audience of this letter being two different cultures, which is Jews and Gentiles, and Revelation 7 verse 9, which Wandi read for us, earlier. After this, I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Considering all this, heritage is not frowned upon, it is reflected upon, it is spoken to, and it is embraced. When Jesus returns, we will see different nations, tribes, people, and languages before him. Our second point, Paul's warning. Paul then continues with warnings about what they should be careful of. Paul uses a word, captivated. Captivated means something that holds your attention, that charms you. So don't be captivated by philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition and elements of the world. To understand what Paul is saying here, we need to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Colossians 2, verse 16 to 23, which follows on from our passage this morning, says, Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belonged to the world? Why do you submit to regulations, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these are, have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and, and severed 
the, and se severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. So Paul is naming some of the elements of the world they should be aware of. Verse 20, Paul mentions that if we have died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do we live as if we belong? So the elements of this world are things he has mentioned. It's food, it's drink, it's festival, it's a Sabbath. These are regulations, and regulations are part of the elements of this world. The regulations are based on actions such as don't taste, don't touch. And these regulations are based on human tradition and have a reputation for, for wisdom, a reputation for wisdom. This reputation of wisdom is linked to philosophy. So the pursuit of knowledge for your own reasons. So verse 8 is all described here in verses 16 to 23. They are practices that seem wise because they create a religion by themselves and a sense of false humility while not adding anything to fighting sin. Paul is specifically speaking into practices of a legalistic nature or extreme self-denial as a way to justify oneself and not the substance being Christ. This is part of the severe treatment of the body, which in fact doesn't curb self-indulgence, which is what Paul says. Paul is saying, don't be judged and or disqualified by practices, by worship of angels, by claiming access to visionary uh, realm. Don't be disqualified by regulations and human commands and doctrines of self-made religion. These are a shadow of what is to come. The substance is Christ. That's what Paul is saying. Our third point, wisdom. In verses 9 to 10, Paul speaks about fullness and being filled. Let's look at Ephesians 3, verse 17 to 19 to understand what Paul means with fullness and being filled. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and firmly established in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the length and width and height and depth of God's love, and to know Christ's love that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We see the same words and ideas. We see being rooted and firm in Christ as we see in Colossians. We see that it's in love, in the love of God. These are the same words or, or ideas expressed within Colossians. Wisdom and knowledge are good. Paul's instruction and warning come with great comfort. Comfort in knowing that Christ is the head of all things. That he is the head over all rulers and authorities. That Christ is the head of the church and has triumphed over death and rules over all authorities. Colossians 2, verse 14 to 15, he raised the certificate of death with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and has disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. This means we follow him. He has created a new tradition, a new culture that we adopt if we have put our faith and trust in him. This is the same heritage and culture that we, we see used through the word received in Colossians verse 6. So this doesn't mean that we forget or renounce our heritage at first birth. It rather means that we embrace our first birth culture. We redeem or challenge aspects of that first birth culture which go against our new culture or heritage in Christ. Our second birth culture is Christ crucified. It is our new identity as children of God. Our first birth heritage is part of what we will see in Revelation 7 verse 9. Multitudes from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the Lamb of God. If there are practices either of perceived wisdom or regulations from our first birth, if they move us from Christ, crucified, if they move us from Christ being center of our lives, if they try to fool us into believing things opposed to the gospel, we need to move away from those practices and seek Christ. 
our second birth culture and heritage needs to redeem what is opposed to Christ in our first birth culture. As we close, you would, have, you would be thinking, what are the next steps for me listening to this panel discussion or listening to the sermon? Here are a couple of things to consider. A couple of next steps. Maybe one or two of these next steps challenge you or bring about some curiosity or resonate with you. Some of these will be practical. So if you are one of my vanilla or chocolate brothers and sisters, then don't take offense at some of these. But hear them from a heart of unity, a heart of listening, of learning, of loving, as one body of Christ. Real talk. Don't subscribe to religious syncretism. Some African cultures believe in religious syncretism, the merging of African belief in ancestors and including the Bible to create one new belief system. So praying to their ancestors, speaking to their ancestors, asking for guidance and protection while doing the same to God. Paul says, no, this cannot be. He says we must not be condemned or swayed to practice worship of angels and claiming access to visionary realm. Paul says Christ is enough for salvation. He is supreme. I know that this is hard because it means you may be alienated from your heritage if you choose to go against some practices. My wife and I were alienated by taking a stance of not practicing some cultural beliefs. But we chose to be loving but firm in what the Bible says. People who have died are dead. They are not secretly punishing or helping you. Real talk, the gospel is for everyone. Some African cultures believe that the gospel is a Western culture only. Kuliso spoke about a boat bringing this gospel to Africa. No, it is not. Rather seek wisdom and knowledge. Seek God for yourself. Don't listen to fine-sounding arguments that distort the truth. Seek the truth yourself. Colossians 1, verse 27 to 28, God wanted to make known among the Gentiles the glorious wealth of, his, of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The gospel is, is for everyone. Christ came to save everyone who would call on his name. Here's something else to note. In Acts the story of Philip and, and the Ethiopian eunuch comes before the conversion of Paul. This shows that the gospel traveled south before it traveled and continued to grow in the west. Seek Christ yourself. Don't listen to fine-sounding arguments. Real talk. Don't think I'm more special than others because of my heritage. Some cultures believe that they're more special than others Think of the Zulu and Afrikaans culture, just to name a few. But again, most cultures fit into this bracket in one way or the other. We know that the Kosa believe that they are more persuasive in their tongue, just to show that it fits all cultures, that some cultures think they're more special than others. Paul says, we must be joined together in love that we must have complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ in you. Find this in Colossians 2, verse 2 to 3. I want to read Colossians 1, verse 9 to 12 for us. We are asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the saints' inheritance in the light. We share in the same inheritance. Real talk. Reino mentioned this. I'll do my own thing then. It would be easy to push away from culture when we disagree, when we don't see eye to eye. It would be easy to choose to only stick within your cultural traditions or expressions or within your ideas. When there's disagreement, we ought to seek reconciliation through conversation and dialogue. This is God honoring. 
See, Revelation 7 to 9 shows that all cultures will bow before Jesus Christ, not only your own. Real talk. Don't say things like, I don't see color. And it actually means you don't see me. Whenever I walk, even in the stand or even in the structure, everyone else sees me and sees that I'm not like them. This is a fact. I can tell you of many experiences of people either avoiding me, scared of me, and not because I walk with my stick, or rather wanting to talk to someone else who looks more like them. This doesn't happen often in Fellowship City, but it's the reality of the context that we live in. So saying I don't see color would mean that you don't embrace the fact that I'm different. Real talk. Don't say things like you should meet X. You'll really get on. This may have the best interest at heart, but you should be careful that we aren't doing this because of our own cultural biases, that we're trying to mix people of similar cultures. The question I'd ask is, do you have a relationship with X? Real talk, don't say things like, you can't speak about race to other cultures. It's good to listen and learn, and it's okay to contribute to conversation. Just check your heart that you're not trying to contribute for the sake of contributing, but to show compassion, to show love and understanding. I would say, even in a transcultural space, don't be quick in trying to speak and thinking you know that you have been in a multicultural church before, that you have chocolate friends that you don't have cultural biases. I would say be quick to listen, quick to learn, ask questions with humility and respect, and be ready to repent when needed. Real talk. Don't say things like, all vanilla brothers and sisters are privileged. This is not a helpful statement and it's a generalization. Rather get to know someone, you will find that there are different situations and cultural expressions that others experience. Real talk. Don't say things like, you're not allowed to talk about racism because of dot, dot, dot. You can add what you want there. We should not dismiss someone's perspective solely based on their race. We should be open to engage in open conversation and encourage diverse voices to contribute to discussions around race and heritage. Real talk, and I'm going to come to Coliso at some point to help me with this one. Real talk, learn to say someone's name correctly. We should learn to appreciate the history and nuance in people's stories. And this goes with also learning to say someone's name correctly. This shows love, this shows respect. Real talk, why do black lives matter? Don't all lives matter? This isn't political for us as a church. This also does not mean we recognize that other cult that we don't recognize that other cultures experience either acts of violence or painful moments of injustice. All lives do matter. This simply means we're sympathetic to systemic injustice, to unique challenges and inequalities that face our chocolate brothers and sisters. If there's an incident that causes injustice, unique challenges and inequalities, we may talk about these candidly, and we have in the past. Because we would believe it is a great opportunity to mourn with those who are hurting and to learn more about some of the systemic injustice, unique challenges and inequalities that others face. We have done this and we will continue to do this. Real talk, speak to someone new. We create these spaces purposefully during our question of, the, uh, question of the day, during the coffee break when we release the kids, we create spaces that, so that you can be known and others would know you and you would know others. Real talk, join a space to serve and you will see and experience firsthand the diversity that exists. Most of the ministry spaces we have are diverse because there's different people who serve together. Join these spaces, learn new heritage, new people, experience new people.
as a church, one of our distinctives is being a transcultural church, which means having a view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context, and by the power of the gospel transcends this to create one new community in Christ. That's part of who we are, if you cut us. That's what we bleed. We see, embrace, reflect, and enjoy the diversity of cultures that exist. But we know that by the power of the gospel, our second birth culture creates one new community in Christ. Let me pray for us, and then after I'm going to ask the panel to come back up front. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, this morning we can reflect, enjoy, and embrace the diversity of cultures that exist within the place you've placed us. That we can hear stories, real stories of people about their heritage, about the things that they love about their heritage and the things, heritage and the things that they want to see redeemed by uh, the gospel, by their second birth uh, heritage, which is Christ crucified. I pray that you would enable us to continue to um, reflect, enjoy, and embrace the diversity of our context, that you'd enable us to join spaces where we can continue to learn more about one another, that we would embrace one another and not just desire proximity. I pray that by the Holy Spirit that you would build up this community, that this community would reflect unity and diversity in the context where you've placed us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a hand already been... Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning, panel. <clears throat> panel, do you really think Christianity is a Western God? If you, if you just look at the Western world, I, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Want to go first, mate? Bo sure, Ramashi. okay. So, <laughs> I should be saying I don't, what, what does this mate, uh, I don't know too much of the history, but I don't think history would suggest that it's truly Western, as Liso was re um, referring to the story of the eunuch and stuff. So I don't even think history suggests that. I think in modern times, probably what you're alluding to is just the acceptance or denial of the gospel in the Western world. Um, I think historically the West accepted it earlier in history, and I think throughout time, um, sort of south and like in Africa, we accepted it more and practiced more, um, where the West kind of denounced a lot of the gospel. So I think it's manifestation now there's probably even much less than in African spaces. So, so I think it's, um, it's just fine sounding arguments, right? So we have a lot of people who've got uh, big voices that speak a lot about um, embracing African culture and they do it at the expense of the gospel in saying that um, th these are all Western practices that the West continue to want to put on us. And because these are sometimes spoken about by prominent people who've got voices, these fine-sounding arguments uh, keep going to the ears of people who then believe them because they're not rooted and established in the faith. Um, but it's not true. So if, if people were to, to, to do their research, you would even see just as basic a story as just the Egy Egyptian unit traveling um, south first before it continued into the west. But no one wants to read for themselves. No one wants to grapple with the gospel. They don't want to seek Christ themselves. They do rather believe fine-sounding arguments to try and uh, detangle themselves and create this new African expression while still using the gospel. So while still using the Bible, just using bits of it and adding a little bit of African culture to create one new um, syncretic uh, type of religion. Yes, mate. Yeah, mate. I am going to say something very nerdy now, but just stay with me. So one of my heroes, David Bosch, he passed away in the early 90s. He was an unbelievable theologian and a thinker on missions and on missiology. What a champ! He wrote a 600-page book called Transforming Mission. And apart from the Bible, that's probably the only book that I've read twice cover to cover. He said, mission is about inculturation. And what he meant with that is 
present the gospel into a culture as pure as you possibly can and then allow the gospel to rebuke cultural things, allow the gospel to um, redeem certain cultural things and allow the gospel to apply certain uh, cultural things all the while together with the people of that culture. And he wrote in the early 90s that that's the way that modern mission movements should have done it. Unfortunately, many of the modern mission movements that came from the Western world that went into the continent of Africa, when the question was asked, okay, yes for Jesus, what now? Like, how do I do this? How do I live according to this? The simple answer was, well, just do it like we do it. Okay, cool. So how do you do it? And that's where a form of Christianity seemed to have been imported and seemed to have oppressed people. Even though it's not the truth, it's just that's the way that the modern mission movements did it. And unfortunately, that gets used as fodder and ammunition against why it's Western. Here's my answer to that argument. Dude, it's 2023. It doesn't work like that anymore. So even though you might use that as some form of argument against it. I don't put down my template of discipleship on Lesecho and neither does he on me, right? The world has changed. Sharing the gospel and now allowing the gospel to transform people in communities and to reflect, embrace, and enjoy culture, that's where we are now. So I just don't think that that argument can be used anymore. Modern day can be used if you want to pull it from history, but I think modern day that argument does fall flat. Very nerdy, but very important. Does that, uh, does that, uh, you happy with that, Ben? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, feel free to raise your hand. Josie. Uh, this is for Ray now. Um, I missed something in your answer earlier. Uh, when Lesecho asked the question, um, why did you, a white guy, plant a transcultural church? And I wondered if you could say something about reconciliation. So uh, I became a Christian in 2005, and I was exposed to a very, very diverse church landscape from 2005 all the way through until I got my first job as full-time minister in 2012. And all the while, as I was exposed to, and if I talk about diverse churches, I talk about churches in South Africa. I also talk about a lot of cross-cultural mission into Botswana, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, etc. Swaziland, that's where I met Marie, just as a side note. Um, And all the while, I realized that the gospel has a way of unifying people. And that's something that is beautiful to me, right? When we really love each other as brother and sister because of the gospel, I felt like that's something that resonates with my heart the whole time. And I mean, the ministry of reconciliation, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, was given to us, right, as believers. So call people to be reconciled to God and then call people to be reconciled to one another. And um, when I did my very first sermon, the 26th of February 2012, that's a way in the Dutch Reformed Church that you make a statement with your first sermon, and you preach about what really resonates with your heart. And I preached on the ministry of reconciliation. And that day I said to a 100% white, 100% Afrikaans church, fam, you are going to hear this from me the whole time. (laughs) Because it's something that I feel really strong about. It's something that not only resonates with my heart, but it's something that creates a really compelling testimony for the church when people are truly reconciled to one another. So then, five years in, when Marie and I started praying about what's next for our ministry season, nothing of that died down. On the contrary, it just gathered more steam and more flame. So when we felt the call to plant a church that was going to engage exactly that, we knew that the time was now, and that was a preparation season for us. Is that a good answer? Cool. Is there another question? Mayemu. Uh, I just I don't know how deep it will go but I just wanted to ask in the space of 
how do we define culture? Yes, we talk about like this is cultural and now this is Christianity and um, my question mostly is, okay, here I am um, praying and then I'm calling out to God uh, on the word, following the Bible mm -hmm. and all those stuff uh, without looking at the Bible in a way that this is suited at this time. Like, this is the old, this is the new. Mm. But then, not picking and choosing mm. what fits at that time. Mm. Then I go into prayer. While I'm praying, something says to me, go wherever where you need to. Do one, two, three. Then sometimes when you pray, it says, light a candle there and pray. So it says, pray up until I tell you what to do next. Then that fine line, how do you now put it in a space of saying, is this culture just because somebody said this mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. not right for Christian or this is something that you are doing but then remembering in the Bible in Matthew it says when you go into prayer get into your safe room and do whatever that God tells you to do at mm -hmm. that time then where is that fine line of saying at that time what I'm doing just because so I will just be as direct as I can be. Mm. The world has put this thing of saying, okay, if I switch in a candle, then you are worshiping something. Not worshiping anything, it stays on, then I just told her, okay, just switch it on and then mm. continue with the business of the day that you do, read your Bible and pray. Mm. Then that fine line of saying, am I doing the right thing just because I feel like if somebody gets in and then find me doing that, will you look at me as in like I'm worshiping something that is not, whereas also in the Old Testament, there are people who were sent somewhere, Moses was sent somewhere, something happened there which when you find it happening, you can in, the, in our eyes now, you can judge it as something, why is he doing that. Mm. Wanna take a step? Uh, okay, let me, let, me, let me speak first and then you, you, you guys. Uh, so I wanna read two, Colossian, two, two Colossians uh, verse two to three. I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So I think we don't spill um, all our cultural practices and traditions because we have a new culture in Christ. So we don't say, um, we don't d denounce our, 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 her our heritage and culture, but we do need to, with the wisdom and knowledge of Christ, look at the things that we have practiced or have continued to practice, and if those things move us further away from God. So for instance, um, if you got cultural practices that, that involve speaking to the ancestors for one, you know that the ancestors are, are, are dead, so you're not gonna speak to them, but you might still have a, a space where you remember them. There's nothing wrong in creating a space where you would remember someone, but if you're going to be speaking to them as if they live and hoping and putting your faith in them to help you, when, you, when you're going through struggle or, or difficult times, or when you got this new car, you have to go and then take this new car to them and say, well, this new car has been received, thank you. Then you're moving away from Christ being supreme and Christ being enough. So 
we have to know the word of God. We have to know what God would desire of us. And then we need to then look back at culture and speak into it. So for instance, I, sp I spoke about my wife and I. Some of the things that, that was put on, on the table for us was that uh, for her to be welcomed, um, we need to slaughter in these ways. And for us, it was like, no, uh, then, then we're not doing it. Like, in love, this is why we stop here. We can have the function, we can be together, but we're not going to be speaking to some other medium to say, well, now she's coming in, you just see that she's coming in. You see, did you see she walked through the gate? Um, Christ saw that she walked through the gate. That, that was enough. Um, so it's looking at the cultural practices and seeing if they're moving us away from Christ uh, to stop them. But it's also in the sense that where, where we might make decisions that make others stumble. So if there's a function and people are looking to see if you're going to go, if you're going to practice something, then maybe consider whether your actions in what you're about to do may make other people stumble or make other people grapple with something that's, that's um, compromising their faith. So there's nothing wrong with lighting a candle. So if you felt that, well, I want to light the candle, as long as you're not believing in summoning some other kind of um, uh, visionary realm, or uh, if you, or like with food, right? So there's nothing wrong with eating, with eating pork. It is, it is lovely if you put it on a braai <laughs> with a little bit of glaze on it. Um, yes, yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say the same two things. So I think the first is a heart thing. So where is your heart as a believer um, and how that manifests in practices? And I think the second thing is a wisdom thing. So particularly if people look to you as um, a Christian mentor or when they see you, they, um, what's the word? Like yardstick practices of Christianity to you. She did it, therefore it's right, you know. In those settings, I think being aware of what your action may do, how it may be interpreted, even where your action is benign, but if the interpretation may be tricky for someone else or introduce a conversation that becomes difficult to navigate, then that's where the consideration is. But I think in terms of a rule, I think that's quite, it's quite difficult because practices, there's so many, mm. um, and things signify things. So fire symbolizes so much in history, um, and it can be interpreted in so many ways. So I think it, understanding the symbolism as well, yeah. I just want to add to my two brothers, here's the joy of Christianity, is it starts as a relationship. And that relationship means that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And Jesus promises about the Spirit that the Spirit will teach you everything that He taught us. And then that that Spirit transforms you to look more like Him. So being a Christian means having a clear understanding and discernment about what God is expecting of me with this full-time companion 100% inside of us. So what do I do now? How do I act now? It's never a list of things to do. It is in the context of this relationship with Jesus, he reforms all of those things. We struggle through these things together, obviously. I'm not saying that it's all hyper-individual and all of you can do whatever you want. I am just reminding you that Christianity is such a free faith because it's about a relationship with Jesus and then allowing him to call the shots, right? And with Jesus living inside of us through his Holy Spirit, you do experience moments of, oh, whoa, 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 dude, we don't do that. That's conviction of sin. Mm -hmm. And if that is a cultural practice that everyone says is right and the Spirit says no, then you take that stance that Lysakos spoke about, and that is, this is just not compatible with my relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me. Mm -hmm. And then it's our joy to figure these things out in the context of community, in the context of relationship, and then talking about how do we now do this. I said earlier, I don't oppose my template on Lasejo, and he doesn't oppose his on mine. Do we talk about marriage a lot? Absolutely. Mm. Do we talk about parenting? Do we talk about faith? Do we talk about leadership? Do we talk, <laughs> we talk about these things so much, mm. but it's because we have to figure out what is it that the Spirit wants us to do mm. Yeah. Yeah. Some good news. One more question, if there is. If there are more questions, you're welcome to. Um, I think what we'll do is send me the questions if, you, if there are more. Uh, but let's get one more. And if there are more, we'll create more spaces where we can have such kind of conversations. Yeah, just one more. Mm -hmm. For, no, it's from me. Okay. <laughs> Particularly for, 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 for Kone and, and Bethany. Regarding what you mentioned with regard to something that 
didn't sit so well in your, in your cultures, particularly for you, Kone, when you say that it felt as though the women were being marginalized because uh, they did everything and, and the men would just be sitting down. And, and Bethany, you mentioned that, you know, in, in your culture mostly, it's, it's, they, there's no defined roles. And I'm looking at it from a perspective of, from particularly the black culture, the issue of divorces when I grew up in the olden days, I think it was very, very minimal. And mostly I believe it emanated from the hierarchical structure of, you know, roles. And now we find ourselves in a situation where those roles are being done away with. And it seems that when they are being done away with, then it is the more the divide and the divorces are becoming more prevalent. Do you think that the rates of divorces that we are seeing now emanate from those particular uh, hierarchies being done away with? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I think, Shabu, what we are moving towards is a very, so I said with the English culture, we are very selfish, individualistic culture, where it's often about myself, right? So I see that kind of permeating into the world as it is a pattern that I think is coming, becoming more and more normal in the world. And I think the beauty of cultures where there were defined roles and defined structures is that it was very clear that you're working towards creating a better community. It's not about self, it's about the people in your family, it's about respecting your family, it's about honoring your family. So I think I can't speak to specific roles, but what I can say is that I think marriages, it's more and more about what makes me happy. And it's not necessarily about like coming to the table and saying I'm willing to compromise here, I'm willing to have this difficult discussion, I'm willing to show grace, I'm willing to step aside and submit in this area, but it's more and more like, well, I refuse to do that, and I refuse to do this, and I'm a, and I think also like with your newer generation, well, I'm an educated doctor, so why should I be doing X, Y, and Z? Like, so I think it's more and more that we just have lost perspective of what the covenant of marriage is and what it's supposed to be achieving, mm -hmm. and um, I, th I look at my own heart, and I think Kuliso is often the person who is more willing to come to the table and more willing to have the difficult discussions, and I'm often the one who's so hardened, and I just think that's grace, because that's the Lord working through my husband, and, and like, honestly, um, so Yashima, I think it is that very much we're moving in that direction. It's the movies we watch, it's the books we read, it's the culture mm, we yeah. see around us, it's just everywhere and then when we're no longer happy in our marriage and we feel that our spouse is not giving us what we want well then the next step is divorce yeah. and i think there's no discussion about reconciliation or counseling or getting family involved to sort of give wisdom it's just this is what we're doing i don't know if that's helpful or not that's sort of my take on it that's yeah that's helpful um thank you bethany Kune, do you want to share something I don't want to say anything because after I preached about marriage, I, w I was right. No man came to speak to me after that hard one, so I don't want to say anything <laughs> there. Um, but if there are more questions, feel free to send them to myself or Reno, and then I think we'll create more spaces like this where we can engage um, and speak about, uh, about heritage and speak about how that affects um, our outlook as believers within the context that God has placed us in. Father God, thank you um, for your love for all of us. Mm. Thank you that you brought us to this place, that you saved us, that you called us to be part of your church, and that we have the privilege of, of being part of a community like this in which we can have these kinds of conversations. I know, Holy Spirit, that with you inside of us and with the word opened up today, something moved, something shifted. There was either discernment, wisdom, comfort, power, strength, or conviction. The list goes on. I pray that we would, um, that we would embrace these moments. I pray that you would keep on transforming us into the image of Christ. 
And I pray, Father God, that this church will become a testimony to the power of the gospel in this city. I pray that you would give us the grace and the mercy to transcend all of our man-made boundaries and truly to become one new community in Christ. I pray that you give us a desire to love one another. I pray that you give us humility to learn from one another. I pray that you give us a compassion for one another, that when we turn towards one another and we look each other in the eye, we see each other as humans created in your image, dearly loved by you to such an extent that you gave your own life on the cross for us. Grow our ministry, grow our impact, grow our church, grow our love for one another. Lord Jesus, we know that this is your will, and we want to faithfully respond. Thank you that we can have a day like today. Thank you that we, um, like Wandi prayed this morning, that we could be so aware of the beautiful diversity in which you created us. Thank you that we can have food together and uh, have community around a plate of food as well. You teach us, Lord Jesus, to pray that we would receive our daily bread. And um, I pray that we would be cognizant of your provision for us as we eat together. May your name be glorified around the fire of the bride as well. We pray that in your name. Amen. Mm-hmm.